Hi, I'm Jim Lloyd. I'm Program Director for Junior Appalachian Musicians, and today we're going to talk about the evolution of Appalachian music. Now, there's many steps to this and many instruments, so I've bought out a large portion of my collection to do this with, and uh, we're going to start with the very first instrument to come to Appalachia, or among the first instruments. There were really two major ones. So when you come up into the mountains, you're facing hardships, uh, lack of food, you had to hunt for your food, what you had, you had uh, uh, warring with the Native Americans, so you didn't have a lot of extra room to carry your instrument. So they carried the easiest thing they could, and you know, just like us, they had to have their music. We use iPods and stuff, but they had these. Now this is called a juice harp or a jaw harp. And these go all the way back. They had them in ancient Egypt. The Vikings had them. They've been with mankind a long, long time. And they were all different sizes and shapes, but I picked this one because it's one of the louder ones. And they made kind of a boingy noise, like So people would sing with them. They played with fiddles and things like that with them. So um, I'll try to do a little song here. We got time. I went down to the packing house and stole the ham. Ain't nobody knows how mean I am. I took it right home and laid it on the shelf. I'm so mean I'm scared of myself. <laughs> so that's a good example. Um, with not many people play these now, and they're, it's really sad because there is a real art form of playing one. Somebody that's really good can go note for note with the fiddle or a banjo, and once again, they're not too loud, so you'd have to mic it, but I'd like to see them come back. Now, the most major instrument in Appalachia when they first got here flat out was this next one. The violin, or fiddle, which is actually a, a German origin word, fiddle. Now, this particular one was made between 1770 and 1790. It's very old, and it's in really good shape. Um, and, you know, they carried them in gunny sacks, and they had leather cases and different ways. But anywhere you went, 1600s, 1700s, anywhere you went, there was a fiddler. Whether it was an inn or a pub, or a church, or a social gathering, or even a hanging, they had fiddlers. Um, the most popular song of the day, or among the most popular songs of the day, was a tune called Soldier's Joy. Now, Soldier's Joy goes way, way back. Soldier's Joy is over 600 years old now. It predates the fiddle. Uh, so you heard a lot of people play that tune. Now, originally, it was played different than what we hear today. It was kind of what you call hornpipe. So most places you went, you heard that sound. They would sing with fiddles. There might be two or three fiddlers playing at the same time. And with the juice harp, uh, sometimes a penny whistle, which I don't really have one of those. But that was really all you heard for years and years and years, that sound. Now, sometime mid to late 1700s, an instrument came over from Africa. And this is it. The banjo. Now the banjo has changed quite a bit, more so than any other instrument from the original. The original would have been a gourd instrument and it had three long strings and one short string, so four strings. Sometime in the early 1800s, the fifth string was added. Late 1700s, early 1800s, we don't know. None of this was really documented too good. But what I'm holding in my hands is an 1840 uh, and this was made by William Boucher, and he was the 
first guy to really mass produce banjos, but all the great banjo stars of that era had one of these. And it's quite a different sound than what you hear now. So you're fretless and it's got gut strings, leather head, and just basically an, an oak pot with a mahogany neck, and that's all there is to it. There's not much with it. Well, okay. We're gonna do a, a song called the cuckoo. So that's the sound that they heard, that combined with the fiddle. Now what this did, the African lick was so syncopated that it changed the fiddle. So we heard how I was doing Soldier's Joy a minute ago. So Soldier's Joy suddenly became a lot more uh, peppy, danceable. <laughs> of the European fiddle and the African banjo was actually the foundation for all American music. That syncopation combined with the notiness is what was everything, blues, rock, country, everything came out of that, that union right there. Now that was the sound for a long time. Guitars were around, but they weren't common in the mountains. Uh, the next instrument that was common in the mountains the Germans bought this instrument over. This is called a Scheihold. And that means, uh, loosely translated to insignificant piece of wood. Uh, they, they don't sound good by our standards. And you tuned it with a clock key. Now this particular one was made um, around 1820 or 30. And this is out of Monroe County, West Virginia, but even by then they had changed. Now, one of the things that people did in the mountains was make with whatever they had. So the Germans took the shy holes and uh, combined with the Scottish people that were here, and they created this. This is called a dulcimer. And they had different amounts of strings, and this one is made with a, a gourd like you grow in your garden, and then they put a wood top on it and a wood fingerboard. Now, dulcimer is Latin for basically a uh, nice tone, dulcet tone. So these, these weren't very loud. Now, originally that would have been played with like a turkey quill, a feather of some sort. I'm using a pick, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. <laughs> they were played with a, with a feather. And like I say, the gourd instruments were not very loud. So at some point, early on, um, we're gonna say by the mid, by the mid 1800s, you start to see them appear like this. So now this is this is all wood with a wood fingerboard and a lot louder. 
So these were popular until around 1900. Very loud. So these were popular until about 1900. kind of bagpipey, so that explains why the Scots liked them. Now that was the sound that when you go to a dance, you would hear fiddle, banjo, dulcimer, juice harp. Like I say, guitars weren't too much in the mountains at that time period. But now we're moving up into the 1850s, 1860s. The very first guitars that I know of that came into the mountains came into the 1850s. So we have an 1850 guitar here. Now this was made by C.F. Martin Company, which is still in business. They were established in 1833. Guitars are very fragile. Uh, not many of these survive. Now this has this has uh, the gut strings on it, which are uh, basically uh, sinew intestines off of an animal. And uh, they sound a lot different than a modern instrument too. Um, Guitars were here much earlier. Uh, of all people, Benjamin Franklin played guitar. So all of a sudden with the guitar, you had a real nice full sound to back up all the old songs that had been around forever. So another good, a good example of this is Polly Pretty Polly, which is, oh, it'd come back to the 1500s or so. so. Polly Pretty Polly, come go along with me. Polly, pretty Polly, come go along with me before we get married, some pleasures to see. So, that we started moving forward after that. Manufacturing technology was moving forward, everything was taking grand steps. So, starting in the 1840s, an instrument came over from Germany. And the mountain people really loved them because they were loud. And this is a 1940s version. Uh, the real name of this instrument is the Melodeon. And they're still played in Europe a lot. And in fact, the, uh, the Mexican people really like them too. Now, when they got here, they became uh, known as squeeze boxes. All the mountain people called them squeeze boxes. And then they were also known as diatonic accordion. And uh, they, they were great for dances. You know, they're so loud, so all of a sudden you had another sound to add in with everything. So this is called the Winchester Gallop. Now, they didn't last long in popularity in Appalachia because the, the bellows on these things is made basically of paper. And they'd get a hole in them and the mountain people couldn't fix them. So they would pitch them. And um, I found them in old log cabin sites and stuff around. Uh, and the, I remember people, still a few people playing them when I was a kid. So they were around some by then. So, like I said, we're moving forward 
do all this technology and stuff, and we're coming to the catalogs. We're coming in business now. The catalogs were something like uh, eBay that you look at on, on the internet. Uh, a catalog was pretty cool because you had all these pictures of these wondrous things that you could buy if you had the money, and you'd buy it, and then possibly two months later you'd get it. <laughs> They would bring them in on the train. You know, it took a long time for stuff to, to travel at that time. So one of the things that, that came about with that was how do you tune your instrument? How do you know if your instrument is in standard tune? Most people use these. Now that's called a tuning fork. And it's not very loud. You have to hit it on something. And you probably can't hear that. So what they would do, I mean, I can barely hear it unless I put it up like that. So what they would do is this. Hear it vibrate? You could also, I don't know if you can hear that, but I can. <laughs> so you would tune this, these were in A. So you tune your fiddle to A, you tune your, your fiddle to one, see how far out we are. Not too bad. So you would tune that one string to that note and then move on. Then later on, they got the pitch pipes, which were like the harmonicas, and that, that was, then it led to the, uh, the electronic tuning. Now, by the time the Civil War was, was really rolling, the most popular instrument in America up through around 1900 was compact. You could carry it with you. You didn't have to tune it and all that stuff, and it came out of the Germans too. That's harmonica. So what they did was take the squeeze box and put just a full scale there and all of a sudden you had a way to, to carry it in your pocket and it was right there. And not as loud, but there's still a lot of people sang with them. Like I say, very compact, very easy, very easy to carry. And I've had, I have seen harmonicas where soldiers carried them in their pockets during the war, and they got hit by a bullet, and it would save their life. So that's something to remember. You all need to carry one in your pocket at all times. <laughs> so as technology moved forward, people got louder, bigger crowds turned out. All of a sudden, these instruments were not loud enough. So this is before microphones. So they were fighting battles always to keep getting louder and louder. By the 1930s, things had gotten pretty standardized. Now, the first thing that happened in the evolution here for the loudness was the banjo. Now, this one is a 1954 Gibson Master Tone. Gibson came up with the design for the modern banjos. Now, this would be like the great, great, great grandson of that one, and probably the great grandfather of what we now play. So it was a little different sound, but in the height of bluegrass, this was the instrument. Now we're going to jump a little forward here with this, just to show you. Uh, by the late 1950s, they were putting a leather head on, I mean a, a plastic head to replace the leather. This is called a resonator, so they first appeared in the 1860s, late 1860s, but they didn't catch on big time until 1925. That's when Gibson standardized the banjo. So all of a sudden you had uh, a weatherproof thing here. The old leather hides didn't do good in the weather. And so this is plastic, so it would, and it's a lot louder. So along with that came a new way to play. Now, there had been a lot of people in the late 1870s, 1880s that got away from the claw hammer like I was doing, and they were playing classical banjo and different forms of two-finger and three-finger. But in the late 1930s, fellow from Shelbyville, North Carolina named Earl Scruggs kind of changed everything. He was uh, very innovative. Now to show you the difference, I'm going to play a song. Uh, I can't guarantee this is note for note the way Scruggs has played it, but to give you the idea, and I'm going to play the same song claw hammer. A lot of difference in the sound there. So 
quite a bit of difference. Both are good, apples and oranges, just depends on what sound you like better. But that was the, the modern banjos were so much louder and so much more powerful than the older ones. And so they didn't need as much microphone. The guitars changed a lot too. And one of the changes was just like the banjo, you started seeing steel strings in the late 1870s. Um, or they became more accessible to steel strings in the 1870s. Now, like my little Martin here, if you put steel strings on that, it would absolutely just fold up. There's just too much pressure on them. So loads of these were destroyed like that. People didn't know any better, so they put steel strings on because the availability of the gut strings disappeared. So this is a 1933 Gibson, and this was the Century of Progress model. These were done for the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, and it had this space age material called celluloid. It was called um, Mother of Pearl, but it's fake Mother of Pearl, and it's made, it is made of celluloid, which is very combustible. Uh, a lot of these burn up because if you just touch that with a, a match or something, it will ignite. Some of them ignite it in the cases. But with the new steel strings, you've got a new way to play. And the African Americans were listening to ragtime piano and, and a lot of different things like that. So all of a sudden you were playing off one man band. You were playing rhythm with your thumb and lead with your fingers. So you... So the blues and the fingerstyle guitar stuff all came out of that. Now your Appalachian guitar player, most of the time in playing a dance, was playing just a standard rhythm with, with a thumb pick. Now flat picks came along later, but the thumb pick was the main one they used. And as we're moving up into modern times, 1920s, 1930s, like always, a lot of the mountain people didn't have enough money to purchase things, so they would make it. So is a, a good example of that. This is called a cigar box fiddle and uh, I would say this one's out of the 20s. So some mountain boy that didn't have the money somehow, a lot of them were made but I think this has an original violin neck on it. Somebody got hold of a busted up fiddle and mounted the neck on a cigar box which the stores would, after they sold off the cigars, they would throw them away. So they were pretty common. Um, they didn't have much sound but it was something to play. And a lot of people took great pride. I've seen very ornate homemade ones too. So the last step really in our instruments would be like this. This is a 1975 Martin uh, D28. Now this was the guitar that all the bluegrass guys wanted because Lester Flat played one uh, he was one of the, the founders of the bluegrass, and it's made of rosewood, which is uh, the first one were from Brazilian, Brazilian rosewood from Brazil. Um, now that's just about extinct, so it's Indian rosewood, but rosewood is very boomy, so all of a sudden you had an instrument that could keep up with the banjo. And he, Lester Flat still played with a thumb kick. Now his big lick, you hear it all the time. So he was the father of that, but the very, very, very booming. So that could keep up with the most powerful of the banjos. Now, we have just scratched the surface. This is the very, very top layer. There's numerous steps in this. The banjo itself, gosh, I could talk for hours on the steps of that, the evolution of the banjo. So, and the history of our music is really unique. We have produced 
a, a very unique sound that the whole world now looks to Appalachia for. The old time fiddle stuff, the old time music, the singing, the bluegrass, which has progressed even farther than the, than the 1930s has come a long way. The music has changed and changed and changed. And, you know, music is a very living thing. So it lives and breathes just like the rest of it. In its lifetime, it will take steps and change. So we've produced all this for the world to enjoy. And I hope you'll enjoy your instrument as much as I have mine. And uh, if you're interested, check out some more stuff. Check out some of the old time musicians. Check out some of the bluegrass stuff. It's all great. Thanks for listening.